folks, and welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again. Great to have you with us today. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you're all staying safe and virus-free uh, wherever in the world you may be. Here in Japan, the lockdowns, if you can call them that, they were pretty lame to begin with, if you ask me. Uh, and not too many people uh, seem to be taking them too seriously in the first place. But in any case, they're slowly starting to lift. And official infection numbers, at least, whether you believe those or not, seem to be going down. So, fingers crossed, first wave might be behind us. Time will tell. Now, as you may recall, we had our second webinar last Sunday. And today's episode is simply the recording of that webinar, or rather the re-recording of the webinar, which I've recreated after the fact. Uh, this recording is best viewed in video format. So, we're linking to it, uh, we're link linking to our YouTube channel in the show notes. If you can view the video rather than just listen to the audio, you'll have the full picture and you'll actually see the presentation as we go through it, as well as the deal analysis files that we'll be reviewing together. If you can't watch it, though, the show notes also contain a link to the documents folder separately, which contains that presentation and those spreadsheets. So you can just browse them later if you prefer. I'd just like to sincerely ask those of you who are going to now stop playing this episode and go watch the video before you get right into it please take this opportunity and make a short stop over at the iTunes store or Spotify, wherever you might have tuned in from, and use this break opportunity to first leave us a short rating, uh, or better yet, a review. We'd really, really appreciate it. And I know it's a pain in the bum if you're listening to your podcasts, and then we ask you for it at the end, and instead of directly going over to the next podcast you've got lined up, you have to then take a break and go rate us. Pain in the bum. So if you're going to be taking a break now anyway, to hop over to our YouTube channel, it's a great opportunity to do so before you start. So please do if you can spare an extra few seconds. Okay, so to those of you who are sticking around with the audio, uh, enjoy the webinar. We've covered some of the more basic stuff, again, like the purchase process, due diligence, um, and of course, more deal analysis, as well as Q&A. Enjoy, and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, welcome all. Good to see um, quite a few of you here who are with us in the first webinar too. That's uh, really encouraging. So in the first webinar, we covered the really basic stuff, right? So property investing generally, some Japan-specific market fundamentals, um, how to pick your locations, financing options, and so forth. And I know that some of you, especially those who weren't with us the first time, did ask to repeat and review some of that stuff again. Um, but I've unfortunately let the schedule slip the first time around. So by the time we got to the really good stuff like deal analysis and Q&A, we were actually past the two-hour mark, which meant that a lot of people couldn't stick around that long. So apologies in advance, but we're not going to repeat that first webinar content, except to mention some of it in passing when we discuss new topics. But you're more than welcome to email me, message me if you want another webinar, um, or even a one-on-one -on -one chat to review all of those materials. Always happy to talk shop with anyone, so don't be shy. And also for the same reason, this time around, we're going to be a bit more strict with the structure. So we're not going to do a Q&A round after each and every topic because we want to make sure that we actually cover those topics that we've got lined out. So we'll do a big Q&A session at the very end. And so rather than type in your questions as we go, um, please write them down on a piece of paper or on your notes app or whatever, so you'll be able to quickly type them or copy paste them uh, into the chat box when we get to the Q&A segment. Uh, so when we do get to the Q&A segment, we'll do the first uh, pre-submitted questions by order of submission that people have sent in uh, when they registered. And then with the remaining time, we'll do the live questions that will come up during the webinar itself. Uh, so you type those in when we reach that point. Okay, so here we go. So our first topic is just a quick outline of the purchase process, which is really similar to what it is in most other countries or at least in most other countries with a um, well-documented legal recourse system in place, meaning you very rarely come across um, those quick, direct owner-to-owner -owner sales that you see in places like India, Eastern Europe, you know, some other Asian, South American, Middle Eastern countries, etc. So those kind of direct sales are rare here in Japan, and we've mentioned this in the first webinar as well. Everything is usually done by the book, and there's almost always a, a shihoshoshi, judicial scrivener or property lawyer, as they're known in other countries involved, and usually a realtor as well. So there's always a paper trail, several miles long, invoices, receipts, property spec documents, and clearly defined title deeds, registration documents, and so forth. Now, there are some exceptions to this rule. Um, for example, if you're working through a buyer's agent like ourselves and the property is being sold by one of our clients to another, 
meaning that it's not listed on the open market and there's already an impartial real estate professional like ourselves involved in the sale. In that case, there's no need for a realtor or a broker. And we'll then just use the scrivener, the property lawyer, to prepare and confirm the documents and then register the ownership transfer. Similarly, if two acquaintances, uh, family members, etc., are conducting a transaction between them, there's no need to involve realtor, of course. And in fact, it's even possible for both of them to just um, show up at the Legal Affairs Bureau and conduct the ownership transfer without even involving the property lawyer. Um, as a side note, we would really advise against that one, just for the simple reason that without a proper sales contract, property documentation package in place uh, that was uh, prepared by a professional, you're really looking for trouble and conflict down the track. So it's best to, hold, to have all information exchanged between the buyer and seller properly documented and signed off on most definitely including the agreed upon purchase price prior to the ownership transfer and confirmed by a property professional, a property lawyer in this case. Um, just friendships, partnerships, even families can really easily be torn apart by these sort of financial disputes. And in many cases, those disputes are instigated by all kinds of real estate dealings between members of that group. So definitely advisable to use a judicial scrivener or lawyer for these transactions, regardless of who's involved. Now, if you're transacting using a realtor or a broker, any agency that you work with would have a judicial scrivener or a property lawyer that they regularly use for transactions, and they'll recommend to use that one. And those will usually be quite affordable. Uh, but if you're not using a realtor or a broker, you prefer to get your own, uh, you can just run a quick Google search in your area, wherever you're buying. Uh, the Japanese word again is shiho shoshi, judicial scrivener, and you can find one online. Okay, so for the purpose of, of our discussion here today, we're looking at a standard uh, run-of-the-mill transaction. Buyer and seller connect through one or two realtors or property brokers. So there could be just one realtor representing both sides, or there could be one buyer side agent who then uh, found the listing, uh, which is advertised by the seller side agent, depending on how the property was sourced. Doesn't concern you as the buyer in any case. The realtors in Japan generally charge both the buyer and the seller side. So if there are two of them involved, it just means that they have to share those commissions between them. In any case, um, you're paying the same amount. And then the procedure on the buyer's side is as follows. So obviously, if you or your Japanese rep contacted the listing agent, this means that you've got interest in the property. And what that should mean is that you're already aware of the location, the property profile, and the numbers that are involved. So the purchase price, the monthly or annual fees involved in the upkeep and maintenance, at least the fixed ones. And of course, either the existing rental amount in case it's tenanted or the estimated rental amount in case it's vacant. If it is vacant, by the way, make sure you do some research of your own. So don't simply count on the numbers that are posed on, uh, posted on the listing by the selling agent because that rent amount that's assumed will often be pretty optimistic and designed to make the property look more attractive. Uh, if it's vacant as well, or even if it's uh, only been tenanted for a relatively short time, let's say the tenant moved, up, uh, moved in up to a year or so ago, you should also be able to know what the interior looks like, at least roughly, maybe see some pictures. Um, so there are hopefully no major innovations required before it can be tenanted again, or if there are, you're at least aware of them. If the property is tenanted though, and we mentioned this in the first webinar, there are no inspections, so you're basically buying sight unseen. All you've got to go on is a tenant's uh, maintenance requests and maintenance history, if the owner has got any of that and so forth. So if all of that info is known and is generally acceptable to you, you then submit your offer. Now, depending on the location and the property profile and the rental yield, you might already be able at this point to negotiate a lower price than the listed price. Uh, in any case, it's always better to clearly write on the application form why you believe the price should be discounted. Um, but of course, bear in mind that if the property and the deal are attractive, the seller is probably going to receive their asking price fairly quickly. And Japan is the world's second biggest property investment market, and uh, hot, hot properties in hot locations sell very quickly here, especially cheaper ones. So use some common sense when you make your offer. Uh, vacant properties that are clearly investment properties, meaning smaller, um, older types that the people who can afford to buy will not want to live in, and vice versa. The people who uh, need to live in them will not be able to afford to buy them. And these types of properties can obviously be negotiated a little bit more liberally, um, but still within reason. Now, common reasons to ask for a lower price uh, would be things like the structure being particularly old, 
uh, maybe not, uh, maybe prior to 1981, which is the latest uh, earthquake resistant building standards for uh, reinforced concrete buildings. Um, maybe the average comparable in the rent, uh, average comparable rent in the area might be a bit lower than what the current tenant is paying, which means that when that current tenant moves out, you then have to reduce the rent for the next tenant, and that would reduce your yield. Um, Stuff like the property maybe being on the third or fourth floor um, of a building without an elevator, maybe 10 minute walk or further, uh, more than 10 minute walk to the nearest train or subway station. Just all factors that mean it might be harder to source tenants once the property becomes vacant again, stuff like that. So later down the track when we receive the uh, full due diligence on the building and the tenant, and we'll get into that shortly, and that's usually only after the offer was accepted, um, just because the seller and the realtor will not go out of the way to start collecting this info before they've got an offer on the table. Again, Japan being a very active market, really no need for them to do that for anyone who's just tire kicking and generally inquiring about the property. So after we submit the offer and we start receiving the due diligence info, we then might be able to find other reasons to potentially ask for a lower price. Um, for example, if the building's renovation history that we then received or the tenant history isn't super attractive for any reason. Um, so that's why when we submit our first offer, we always write this offer is pending building and tenant information. Now, the reason we put that on the initial offer is that if we suddenly pull back our offer without any legitimate reason, we'll be labeled uh, Mendoxai, pain in the neck, tire kicking foreigners, which is unfortunately an image that we've got here. And then the seller, uh, but more importantly, the realtor, will most likely refuse to work with us again in the future as well. And as we've mentioned in the first webinar, it's really all about building and maintaining relationships in Japan. And foreigners here already have a less than uh, sparkling clean image in many cases. So we really want to make sure that once we found a realtor who is okay working with foreign buyers, we really want to keep them on our side, so to speak. So definitely don't do, for example, what's common practice in many Western countries and you know how we submit offers on a few properties even though we only intend to really buy one of them. Uh, because once you decide which one you are proceeding with and then you pull out of all the other deals, you'll definitely be losing some valuable realtor context there. Um, just because this isn't how it's done here usually. So an offer is binding, even if it's not legally binding. And pulling back offers without any reasonable cause is seriously frowned upon. Now, if your offer is too low for the seller, two things, actually three things might happen. So ideally, if there are not any other offers on the table and the seller wants to sell sooner rather than later, they might come back with a counter offer, which gives you the chance to reapply again, make your own counter offer and so forth until you finally agree on a price. What more frequently happens though is that they'll simply not respond, uh, which means that they're just waiting to see if other higher offers will come in. So again, if you really like the property, don't wait more than a day or two um, before you follow up. So you follow up with a realtor and just ask them if the seller responded or not. And if not, it's usually a good idea to offer a higher price. Again, if, just if you really like the property. If you don't mind letting it go, that's fine. And the last thing that might happen, and this is rare, but it does sometimes happen, especially with the old school elderly um, type sellers. If the price that you offered is too low, which generally speaking could be anything beyond say 20% off the listing price, which is quite rare in Japan. Uh, again, particularly for these cheaper and smaller properties. So some old school uh, Gigi Baba type sellers um, might simply be offended by the offer and then they refuse to even consider other offers from you. Um, strange but true, does happen sometimes. Now, assuming we've made an offer that was pending tenant and building information, we'll then start receiving all of this information as well. And that's a whole lot of paperwork, which is actually good. It's the realtors that don't provide a lot of paperwork or the sellers that don't provide a lot of paperwork that you really want to watch out a bit more for just to make sure that there's not anything missing that you really want to know about. So once the offer was accepted or the counter offer was accepted, we'll now receive the full due diligence info. And that's when we need to both confirm what we already know about the property. So again, the address, the age, uh, price, the rent amount, if there is a rent, and monthly fees, etc. And it's really worth confirming each and every bit of that info because you'll sometimes discover that there's some monthly communal water fee in case of co-owned uh, building where um, each unit owner is a different person. And there might be landscaping fees, uh, owner co-op, again for those co-owned blocks, a membership fee or some obscure fee of that sort, 
which just wasn't specified in the original listing. And that could change your bottom line um, to some degree, more or less significantly. So you want to review the information and confirm that it's as you expected. And then, of course, you want to review the new information which you would have received at this point. So that's the structural info, which basically means the building's renovation history, the tenancy info, and in the case of a co-owned building, you also want to know exactly how much is in the reserve funds pool. So that's the funds that have been collected monthly from all owners and set aside for future innovations and maintenance. And on that front, you also want to know whether the owner's co-op, um, in case of a co-owned building, whether the owner's co-op has any outstanding loan or other debt. And not unusual, again, it might not be a reason for you to pull out of the deal, but you want to be aware of that. And whether there are a lot of owners that still owe money to the owner's co-op that they haven't paid for a long time and so forth. So if there are a few million yens owing for a few good years by various uh, unit owners, that might mean that the management company is not really doing the best job of collecting those fees. So that's sort of information that you uh, want to review. And we'll get into all of that in more detail soon when we discuss due diligence. But the main point is that if any of that info that we now received is less than ideal, uh, but not quite a disaster, so it doesn't want to make us pull out of the deal completely, it might still be a good enough excuse to try and renegotiate the price at this point because it does represent a higher risk factor than we thought, and there's something in there that could mean reduced yields or increased expenses not too far down the track. And again, if we renegotiate the price, we want to explain exactly and clearly why we're doing that so that everything makes sense to both the seller and the agent, just for those relationships to remain intact and for us to be able to do more business with them down the track. So again, don't forget the percentage of sellers and agents who are happy to work with foreigners in Japan is a lot lower than it is in other countries. So we really want to nourish and cherish those relationships with them, keep everything above board. Okay, so assuming we're satisfied with the due diligence, everything is moving forward according to plan, we'll now agree on a settlement date, we'll receive a purchase contract draft, and also a draft of a contract between us and the listing agent. Uh, their fees are normally dictated by law, so there shouldn't be too much to confirm here. The only exception is super cheap properties. So, for example, um, apartments in ski resorts that are being sold very, very cheaply by owners that simply don't use them anymore and they don't want to keep paying the monthly resort fees, which can be pretty high. Or, say, abandoned homes in the countryside and so forth. So, these kinds of places are often just sold for a few thousand bucks. And in those cases, the realtor will want to earn at least the basic minimum transaction fee to make their time worth it. So um, 5% of 5,000 bucks is, of course, not worth their time. And in these cases, they'll just add a special, uh, say, facilitation fee or something like that just to make sure that they get paid for their time. So just confirm that so you're aware of what you're paying the realtor. And then once you review the contracts and you're happy to move forward, you'll set a day and time for a signing meeting. So those meetings are a bit of a pain because the realtor will need to go through every single word and every single document together with you. And like we said, there should be a lot of paperwork there just to confirm that you understand everything that you're about to sign. Uh, and again, if they're doing the job properly, that's a whole lot of paperwork. So it normally takes at least an hour, sometimes up to two hours or so, especially if you're using an interpreter or a Japanese rep. And once that's done, you sign the documents, you pay the deposit, which is normally 10% to either the realtor or directly to the seller. And in any case, make sure you get a receipt if you've paid it in cash. Otherwise, your bank remittance receipt is, of course, fine too. And then a few days later, you'll receive the settlement statement from the realtor and the judicial uh, scrivener, the property lawyer, and that'll tell you exactly how much you need to remit on the day of settlement. So what they do on the statement is they credit the seller for anything they've paid in advance, like say property tax for the year, uh, building fees for the next month or two, etc. And they debit the seller for anything they've received. So rent, security deposit, anything they've received in advance that they've already collected from the tenants uh, ahead of the settlement, if the property is tenanted. And then on the day of settlement, you'll remit the rest of the funds as per that statement, confirm the payment to the property lawyer as well, and then the property lawyer will transfer the property ownership over to your name. Uh, the new title deed and registration papers usually take between two to four weeks to arrive, depending on how busy things are at the Legal Affairs Bureau. But the property is, of course, yours from the day of settlement and registered under your name. 
Now, for tenanted properties, if you're buying a property that already has a tenant in it, sometime during the documentation phase, the realtor will ask if you want to keep the existing property manager or the tenant manager, uh, Chintai Kanri, they're called in Japanese, or whether you're planning to replace them with your own appointed property manager. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. So if you're working with a property manager that you want to take this property on, just let the agent know at this point, And of course, let your property manager know because they'll need to get in touch with the tenant to let them know about the changeover, uh, give them the new account details for rent deposits and so forth, give them new contact numbers for maintenance, emergency requests. And you'll also need to fill in some forms at this point to let the tax department know where to send your purchase tax and your property tax statements. And also to notify building management in case this is a co-owned apartment block that you're the new owner and that they need to be uh, charging you for the building fees and sending you any correspondence. And lastly, at this point, you'll want to set up property insurance. So your uh, average insurance, typical insurance in Japan is called fire insurance, but it also includes coverage for any sort of accidental, natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, and so forth. And you also want to get landlord insurance if the property is tenanted or going to be tenanted. And this one is really, really important. That covers you for any injury or death in the property, any damage to the tenant if it's tenanted or going to be tenanted. And I really can't stress enough how important it is to get this clause. Uh, because Japan being Japan, and again, we've touched on this on the, in the first webinar, tenants are often old, uh, they can die in the property, and this can happen even with younger tenants, by the way. And the amount of expenses and headaches that these 30 or 40 bucks a year will save you is unreal. So definitely get full landlord insurance coverage, including cover for death in the property. Make sure that's in there. Now, if you're only buying one or two properties, um, it doesn't really matter that much which companies you're going to be using. So you can just search online for attractive listings, work with whatever realtor or broker you happen to be buying from, use their in-house property lawyer, the Shihoshoshi Judicial Scrivener, and keep the same property manager they've already got in place. Makes things nice and easy. Don't need to change anything for the tenant uh, as well if it's not necessary because they can spook pretty easily in Japan. And this is Japan, so it's very unlikely that any of these professionals are majorly problematic. So they might not always be super efficient or communicative or professional, but they're very rarely going to be outright criminal or problematic. Uh, that virtually doesn't happen here. So professionals in Japan tend to do their job by the book. And both the brokers, the realtors, and the judicial scriveners are closely monitored and governed by both legal authorities and by their own industry certification bodies. So there's really not much to be afraid of um, on a malpractice front. Now, property managers basically charge 5% uh, of the gross rental income and then one or two months of rental income when they place a new tenant in a property. So as long as the PM that you've got in place already is in line with these fees, there shouldn't be any issue to just continue working with them. Um, it makes more sense not to rock the boat for the tenant again if you're buying a tenanted property rather than start sending them letters about the PM changing over, asking them to start depositing the rent to a new bank account. No need to do that um, if you don't have to. However, um, if you are planning for multiple purchases down the track and you're planning long-term to be building a portfolio and not just buying one or two cheaper properties, it does make a lot of sense to build your own team to work with. And, and that's, that's for, for a few reasons. reasons. So, so the most, most obvious reason is that that's just, just a major, major pain in the bottom to be in touch with uh, five or six or ten different entities as opposed to just two or three. So you want to communicate your requirements, receive reports from one or two property managers as opposed to seven or eight of them because that's going to be a huge time and headache saver for you, especially when you've got vacancies and you have to constantly review the ad terms, the rent amounts, renovation repair reports, ask for second opinion, the maintenance issues, and so forth. And again, again, along the same lines, lines if you've got a good realtor, a broker who already knows what types of properties you're normally interested in, they can be on the lookout instead of you and save you huge amounts of research time. And they'll also know the kind of due diligence info that you want to receive because not all Japanese buyers are interested in all of that detail that we usually ask for. And again, we'll cover that in a moment too. And then they'll make sure to get all of that info immediately after you submit your offer rather than just wait for you to ask for it. And being a Japanese entity as well, they'll introduce themselves to other realtors and other sellers a lot more smoothly than we can as foreigners. Whereas if we contact these entities on, their own, on our own, um, as foreigners, there's always that initial hurdle of the scary gaijin, the foreigner that we need to get through. 
And it, it often doesn't, doesn't even matter how well we speak the language or if we're actually in Japan, even if both are true, just the fact that our name is foreign is enough to scare a lot of agents and sellers off. And if we're not even in Japan, a little alone don't speak the language perfectly with all the proper honorifics in place in each and every sentence and Katie and all that, um, our chances are close to zero. So if you happen to be lucky enough to have found a realtor that you can work with on a regular basis to represent you in front of other realtors, that's a big plus. And judicial scriveners, property lawyers, again, firstly, they can reduce their fees. Uh, as opposed to the realtors whose fees are uh, set by law, the judicial scriveners can reduce their fees. So if they have return business with you, and they often will once it becomes uh, obvious uh, that you've got regular transactions coming from your end, they will reduce their fees. And they'll also be able to reuse some of the more general documents that you provide to them. So uh, stuff like uh, proving your identity, you know, a copy of your passport, statutory declaration if you're overseas, or an address certificate if you're here in Japan, um, all sorts of signature certificates, stuff like that. You really don't want to constantly have, uh, have to prepare new ones and notarize them and spend money and time on that for each and every purchase. So as many documents as they can use uh, repeatedly, the better, obviously. And even the ones that you will need to prepare again for particular purchases, they'll follow the same templates if you're working with the same judicial scrivener. So again, just saves you time and hassles and, and you know, mistakes, which might not be costly, but could be a pain in the bum. And insurance agents, same story again. They can push insurance companies for discounted premiums or even lower their own fees if you're a return customer. And again, having the same policy templates, you know what's covered, you know what's going to happen, regular information channel open uh, for any future claims that you might have, huge time and hassle saver there as well. Um, with property managers specifically, it's obviously a more local matter. So these are companies that will have to attend properties in person whenever they're vacant, uh, handle renovations, repairs, and so forth. So unless you're always buying in the same area, you will have to work with a few property management companies for different properties in different areas. But if you at least try to have 1 p.m. handle all of the properties that you purchase in that same area, and if they're good at their job, you'll find that that's really the biggest time saver and not to mention the biggest profit driver, right? Because obviously a uh, portfolio is only as good as the rental income that it generates. So a good PM just helps keep that rental income nice and stable and smooth and also to minimize vacancy times and related expenses and save you the headaches of dealing with too many decisions, uh, pesky little items that the tenant might ask for. So find a good property manager and listen to their advice. They know their areas and their tenant base like nobody else does. So don't try to second guess them, even if things look a little bit different from a country where you're used to investing or stuff you've read on the internet. Take their advice, they know what they're doing, and you can always replace them. If the results are less than satisfactory and the income stops coming in and it's not renewed for any extended period of time, or you're unsatisfied with any um, renovation estimate or maintenance quote that they provided, you can always replace them down the track, but start off by trusting their advice. They usually know what they're doing. Okay, so now we keep mentioning due diligence and due diligence data. So what does that actually mean? Let's just unpack that. So the first thing to understand is what due diligence is not. Okay, so due diligence is not inf is information on a particular deal, and then it normally refers to everything that's not immediately available in the listing itself or in the uh, general public information. So due diligence is not the process of choosing which deal is interesting or not. It's not deal picking. And it's not the process of choosing which property you might want to investigate further or not. Uh, due diligence is the investigation, and that only comes once you've already satisfied yourself with the basics of the deal and you're happy moving forward in principle. So again, the questions that you need to ask yourself before making an offer on any property, these are not due diligence. And it's not information that you should be asking the realtor or the seller um, or anyone really except yourself or somebody that you trust. Uh, is the location attractive? Why is it attractive? Uh, is it the property profile, the age, the material, the accessibility, the rentability um, attractive and, and acceptable? Is it the property, if it's a property that you might want to rebuild in the future, is it rebuildable? And how easy would it be? How is the zoning? These are all questions that you need to research on your own or with your buyer's agent or with somebody local that you trust before you start making offers. And especially here in Japan, before you start wasting other people's time and answering questions that is really not a job description to answer for you. So if you're not sure on the answers to these questions, either because you're not local or you don't know the market well enough 
or you're, you're just, just not, not experienced or confident enough to try and find these answers on your own, and you want to avoid the trial and error and costly mistakes uh, just because you simply don't have you know, the capital or the time to invest in them, that's the reason to hire a buyer's agent. So again, don't trust the realtors and the sellers to answer these questions for you, because for one, again, they don't have the time to do that and they're not going to pay for it. And not, not for anyone, you just make a few inquiries uh, before you even decide if you're going to submit an offer or not. And more importantly, they're interested in closing the deal and making the sale. So even if they won't lie to you, and in Japan they usually won't lie to you, they also will not feel that much obliged to give you the full and unbiased picture. In most cases, some realtors are uh, really good, uh, and they will, but a lot of them won't, and it's not their job to do that. Obviously, Obviously, somebody who wants to sell a particular product will paint the most beautiful picture possible. So, bottom line, deal selection is not due diligence. So, what, what is due diligence? Well, due diligence comes in once the offer has been submitted and accepted, and it refers to particular information regarding this particular property. So, what does that include? So, first and foremost, like we said, the building or house, in case you're buying a house, renovation history. So every structure requires repairs and maintenance, renovations over time, and the older it is and the more, um, the more shutting materials it's built from, the more frequently it needs those done. And some of these items like exterior maintenance, roof maintenance, um, elevator maintenance in buildings, in buildings which have elevators, these are all quite expensive uh, big ticket items. And generally speaking, they need to be done every 20 years or so for younger buildings. And as the building gets older, it becomes every 15 or even 10 years or less than that. So we always look back at the last 10 years of renovation history, um, unless the building is only 10 years old or so, in which case we're not going to have much done yet. And we want to see that those big ticket items were done. And if they haven't been done, that's okay, but we need to be aware of the fact that they're going to be required sooner rather than later. And we need to budget accordingly. So if you're buying the entire building, you want to make sure that the price you're offering and the capital that you're going to have available for these things, take those renovations into account. And if you're buying a unit or a few units in a building that's co-owned, meaning each unit, again, is owned by a different owner, and there's an owner's co-op and building management in play, in those cases, you also want to look at the reserve funds pool, make sure it's got enough funds in it to carry out these works as they're required. Um, or the other side of that coin, if the reserve funds pool is depleted, you want to make sure that it's depleted for the right reasons. Meaning you want to make sure that those big renovations have taken place in the not too distant past. So it's not likely that they're going to be needed again in the next few years and the reserve funds pool will have time to fill up again. And to pay for them when they do happen. But if the recent renovation history doesn't include those big items and the building is old enough to need them done in the next few years, and the reserve funds pool is depleted, then monthly building fees are definitely going to go up in the near future. Or even worse, each unit owner might be hit with a one-time renovation or repair fee, uh, which could be a good few thousand dollars, depending on what work needs to be done exactly. And the worst thing is um, this combination of a depleted funds pool and lack of renovation could also mean mismanagement by the management company or the owner's co-op. And that's something that you really want to know well in advance because it's never a good idea to buy into a property uh, that's being mismanaged unless the management company has been replaced. And that's something that you'll sometimes see. It's just recently been replaced or the owner's co-op is going to replace the management company. And that's good because it means that they're aware that uh, they were not doing a good job and they're taking action to amend that. But even then, there are financial implications that you want to be prepared for. Now, if the property is tenanted, again, you want to know who the tenant is, obviously. Uh, not all tenants are created equal. And if you're buying an investment property, meaning, again, a property that's only going to be rented out and usually not sold to an owner-occupier, but only to another investor, the market value of that property is directly related to the tenant and the rent amount. So that's really crucial for you to be aware of. Um, because younger tenants in their 20s or early 30s might move out fairly quickly, they might get married, promoted, so you want to know what the average rent is to confirm whether or not you can expect the rent amount that you're currently getting to hold. And older tenants also occasionally, middle-aged tenants, say, get relocated by their employers, sent to another branch office of their company, and if they're really old, they move into a nursing home, or they even get sick or die. And Because don't forget, Japan's been in a deflationary mode until late 2012 or so, 
This means, again, that if your tenant's been in place since, say, 2000, they're probably paying a much higher rent than the average is for the same property these days because uh, salaries and cost of living and everything, including rent, was higher those days. And we spoke about this extensively in our, in our first webinar. So Japanese tenants don't tend to ask for rent to be reduced or discounted or do any kind of rent negotiation. Uh, they might do a bit of it when they move in, but that's it. They'll never do it mid lease. So they'll most likely prefer to just um, keep paying the same rent that they were paying when they moved in, even if it's double these days, uh, if it's half these days, rather than confront the landlord because any sort of uh, negotiation for them is considered confrontation and ask for a discount. And they'll, they're not going to want to move out because, again, Japanese tenants like to uh, keep things as they are and as little change in their lives as possible. But if and when they do move out for any reason, uh, the average rent could be much lower. So again, that's something that you want to be aware of because that's going to be affecting the price of your property. And we also want to make sure that there haven't been any tenancy issues, uh, missing rents, delayed rents, excessive complaints, um, unusual requests. That's pretty rare in Japan, but it does happen. It can happen a lot more with unemployed, mentally disabled uh, types of welfare recipients. And, and even pensioners in some cases, they could be just bored and they're calling up the property manager once a week because they've got nothing better to do with their time. Just don't forget that if you're buying these cash houses, these uh, 20, 30, 40,000 um, and around that area, uh, condo units, you're dealing with low income earners and low socioeconomic profiles. So in Japan, that's not likely to be criminals or drug addicts and so forth, but payment issues can still occur, so we want to confirm that there haven't been any of those. And if the property is vacant or just recently tenanted, again, you want to see some recent pictures available, or at least know what was done to it in the last interior renovation. So you might not pull out of the deal based on that, but again, you want to know what kind of expense you're looking at if and when the current tenant moves out, or what you might need to do to repopulate the property then. If you're buying vacant, it should have been recently renovated. So you should be able to see what exactly was done to it and whether it now looks livable and rentable. All right? So let's get into some deal analysis now so we can see how this all ties together in practice and what we're actually looking at when we do look at these things. So let me just share this deal analysis Excel sheet with you. Okay. So. Let's have a look at a few um, studio one-bedroom units first, which again are the cash cows. Um, so this one is in uh, Yokosuka. If you're not aware of uh, where Yokosuka is, that's a medium-sized, on the smallish medium size uh, city, about 400 or half a million people, which is about 45 minutes or 55 minutes uh, by train from Tokyo, south of Tokyo. Um, it's quite well known as a bedroom community for people who um, commute to Tokyo but don't want to pay uh, the extra price that comes with an apartment in Tokyo and also for uh, quite a few US Army bases that they've got there. So more expat uh, tenants that you can follow in other cities around Japan. And uh, this one is an eight minute walk to the uh, main train station, Yokosuka uh, which is a very good location. 16 or just under 17 square meter studio uh, apartment. So one R in Japan means uh, see here on the layout, the kitchen and the living area are connected. There's no separating door between them. So it's a genuine studio, one R. Um, buy price was just under 4 million yen. So roughly 37,000 US. Gross rental income is 50,000 Japanese yen per month. So about 450 bucks and um, we know that the reserve funds uh, management fee sorry that's just a management fee and the reserve funds fee were recently raised and the building management company and the owners club do not have any immediate plans to raise them further which is good property was built in 1985 so quite old but not um, not beyond the latest earthquake resistance standards that's uh, 1981 again now you can also quickly see the uh, purchase cost breakdown here and in this case, it usually turns out to be somewhere between 15 to 17%. Uh, we like to estimate the worst case scenario of 20% when we try to evaluate the deal uh, before we have all of this information available. And uh, just because the registration, the legal fees, and the purchase tax can vary uh, more or less depending on the actual official evaluation of the property. 
and the, the official valuation is usually a bit different, at least sometimes very different to market price. So an area that's gone up in value, uh, but the government valuation hasn't caught up yet, these fees will be lower. And vice versa, an area that's gone down in value, uh, but the government valuations have not been updated to reflect that yet, will, uh, these fees can be higher. So the uh, legal registration fees in some severe cases can be as high as 80%. So we estimate the worst case scenario of 20%, usually ends up being somewhere around here between 15 to 17, maybe 18%. And tenant in this case is male, 47 years old, living there for eight years, construction worker, and he paid one month security deposit. And we spoke about, in the first webinar, we spoke about potential securities that we can get from tenant. We would prefer to see a higher security deposit um, or a rent guarantee, a rent insurance guarantee company in place, which covers you for at least three months of uh, missing rentals or damages and so forth. We can't, it costs money to join these insurance policies, so we can't force the tenant to suddenly pay up for rent insurance just because the owner changed. Um, but if we don't mind paying that initial premium on their behalf, which is usually equal to worst case one month of rent, it's a good idea to get them onto that. Um, building info here, um, reserve funds, about $24 million in total, which works out to be about just under 10% of the purchase price per unit owner in the building. So we divide that by the number of units and then by the, uh, rental, uh, by the purchase price. So we're assuming a similar purchase price for most units in this building, and that gives us roughly 10% of the purchase price covered in reserve funds per unit owner. So that's a little bit lower than we'd like to see usually, but if we look at the renovation history, we can see that um, the elevator, the exterior uh, were done three years ago. Exterior actually being done every four years or so. Three, four years, and the roof was done a bit long ago, 17 years ago. So there's a roof renovation probably coming up in the next few years. Um, but the rest of the work looks like it was done regularly. The roof was probably not necessary up until this point. And it looks like it's being well maintained, so there's no reason not to think that that roof renovation will not be covered by that 24 million. Uh, and again, the building management company has no immediate plans to raise uh, fees further. They've recently already raised them, so we're assuming that's going to be okay. And this one generates, at the time of purchase, generates 8.6% uh, net pre-tax. So that's including all of your purchase and running costs that we know of not including your individual circumstances as far as property tax and uh, income tax goes, or corporate tax if you're buying it under a company name, and also not including any unknowns um, such as maintenance, vacancies, and related expenses. So this is the yield that you'll be getting net pre-tax at the time of purchase, which is pretty damn good for anything that close to Tokyo. Um, you can reduce that if you don't use a buyer's agent, CR fee here, which is always 5.4% uh, for properties uh, at this price level. If you're going directly with the realtor, that's, uh, that's then removed, in which case you're probably going to be up another 0.3%, or almost half a percent up if you're reducing this fee, and if you're working directly with realtors, property managers, and so forth. And other costs are the property management company, normally they charge 5% of the tax, uh, the building fees, which we've got up here. Um, insurance, which is really minute in Japan. You might want to add, like we said, landlord insurance to that one. So let's say we're adding another three, four thousand yen uh, per year. So that's another, let's call it three and a half divided by 12 monthly. Um, 0.1% uh, different in yield, and again, the amount of headaches that that saves you is phenomenal. So, let's check out another one, Nagoya, right? one of the uh, very attractive locations in Japan as well. We've covered that in the first webinar, but we're happy to discuss that again, uh, location-wise, if anyone's interested. This one, eight-minute walk to the nearest subway station, which is Maike. Location-wise... Um, Suburban, but within a short distance walk to a subway station means you're always going to find a tenant for it. This one's on the first floor of a four-floor uh, four building and might not be super attractive for single females unless, uh, we need more info here, but unless the property is well uh, walled off and secure and nobody can peek into the uh, ground floor units from the street, 
If, if that, that is not the case, case it might not be super popular with a um, single female. So again, something we discussed in the first webinar on how to uh, pick them. And it's got a built-in wardrobe, closet, storage space, and the southeast facing balcony, which is ideal for sunlight. It's a nice bonus uh, when tenants are looking for new properties, they'll be happy with that. Tenant in this case is a 35-year-old single male, company employee, and doesn't specify here how long he's been living there, so we want to check that out, make sure that the rent is on par with average rent for similar properties. And because this tenant profile, as opposed to the uh, previous construction worker who was 47 years old, this one's a salary and a company employee, so they could be relocated or get married and move out fairly quickly compared to a um, different type of tenant. And this one does have a rent insurance guarantee company, so the best security that we could hope for. This one's um, just under 3 million yen, so about 26, 27,000 US. Rent price is, gross rent price is about 40,000 uh, Japanese yen, which works out to be $370, or so at today's rates. Purchase costs work out to be, uh, again, property is cheaper, so usually costs will be higher percentage-wise. So this one is almost 17% purchase costs and generating just under 9% uh, in net pre-tax income, which is phenomenal. Reserve funds, uh, about 7.5 million, which is even lower percentage-wise. So that's about 5.3% of the purchase price per unit owner, assuming a similar price. Uh, but again, if we look at the renovation history, we've got the exterior done six years ago, uh, another part of the exterior done eight years ago. We've got um, drain pipes, water supply, common areas, emergency lighting system. So just based on the list of renovation items, it does look like the property is being fairly well maintained. It is a bit older and we haven't seen and anything done to it uh, as far as the roof uh, is concerned. So that could come up definitely and again in the near future. There are no elevators in the fourth floor building usually, so that's not going to be a concern. So just, we want to probably budget for slightly higher building fees. But if you um, look at the Excel sheet here, if we say raise the building fees reserve fund contribution from 5,000 to say 9,000 yen a month, so almost double, and we're still getting 7.5% net pre tax, which is phenomenal again for Nagoya. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, but something to be uh, taken into account. Next one up, Osaka. Osaka large studio apartment. This one's 21 square meters, so bigger than the other two. Um, the building is very old, 1974, but it's a huge concrete monster that seems to be very well maintained if you check out the pictures. Uh, it's got 151 units in it, and the location is mind-blowing. It's a 10-minute walk to Shinosaka Station, the bullet train station that Osaka uses. Um, so the location is amazing. And these big monster blocks in good locations um, are going to be renovated till kingdom come. So they're not going uh, out of style or out of use anytime soon. Developers are not going to move in to try and purchase them in most cases, or at least not at cutthroat prices like some of the uh, smaller, dodgier developers do. Just because the uh, size of the building and the number of the units means that they have to compensate a huge amount of owners and they have to pay a huge amount of money to demolish and remove the property. This is obviously a reinforced concrete block, probably steel reinforced. Um, so there's not any, probably not going to be any hostile takeovers in the near future. Everyone's got an interest to keep this cash cow going for as long as they can. So in these particular cases, we would normally not advise to buy anything this old, but if you are going to buy anything old, um, this kind of location and this kind of profile is definitely the way to go. Again, south-facing balcony, not southeast, but still plenty of light. Um, larger than average for this price and yield, and also for this location. I mean, a 21, 22 square meter uh, unit in this location is pretty much a luxury for your average uh, single Japanese tenant. And this one is male, 52 years old, in residence uh, since 2003. I'm not sure when this one was purchased, um, but a fairly long time. He's paid a security deposit, which was deducted from the purchase price. And his wife is his personal guarantor, which means they're either separated or that he might be using the place uh, during the week and commuting back home on the weekend. And in any case, a pretty good tenant profile, unless he gets relocated to um, 
another company branch, which at this age is probably not going to happen that often. And so probably going to be a good long lasting tenant. Reserve funds are 25 million, uh, roughly 4.2% of the purchase price. There's a bit of money owing by other unit owners, but with a building that's 151 units, that's to be expected. Renovation history, the roof, exterior, and elevators were done four and eight years ago. The roof was done again three years ago and even this year. So very well renovated. The depleted uh, reserve fund pool is not a huge concern for us with this particular property. And Fukuoka City. Japan's rising star as far as property prices and population go. Um, this one is bigger than all of them yet. It's not a studio, it's a 1DK, so uh, living area, dining room and kitchen, plus four meter balcony. Location again phenomenal, five minute walk to the city's main uh, bullet bus subway train station, Hakata station, the heart of the city, the CBD. This building is 1980, so just one year prior to the latest earthquake resistance standard, which is probably why the price is fairly low. Um, but as we mentioned in the first webinar, we'll often see properties that are older in age, but are being very well renovated, as opposed to newer, younger properties that are not being well renovated and might be even mismanaged. So that's something to take on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, purchase price, because it's a larger unit, about 6 million yen generating a rental income of about 60,000 Japanese yen uh, per month. Um, so that's about 56,000 US to buy and generating gross rental income of about 540 or 550 bucks per month. Um, area info again, super central. Uh, purchase cost here again, it's expensive, more expensive than the other one, so it's purchase cost uh, work out to be a bit lower percentage wise. Larger than usual again for this area and yield level. And the tenant, this is actually a commercial property, so it's being used as an office building management here, allows uh, the use of properties uh, of units as either offices, shops, or residential units. So this one's being used as an office, and that just extends your tenant base if the building management company allows that. Um, you could pick from either commercial or residential tenants next time you've got a vacancy, which is obviously expanding your tenant base. And this one's a trading company. We think that it's Chinese based on the name. In residence, uh, again, I'm not sure when this one was bought, but since October 2014, they have rent insurance. Again, the best kind of security, and they're also obliged by contract to pay a cleaning fee when they vacate. Reserve funds, again, pretty low, 4.1% of the purchase price. The management company has recently been fired due to financial mismanagement. And I like a company which replaced its CEO, that's actually a good sign. It means that the owner's co-op is aware of the problems and they've taken action to amend them. Uh, exterior and elevators were done as recently as last year. That's most likely right after they replaced that management company. Um, uh, even this year, they've done the exterior stairwells. Uh, they're planning to install a new elevator system, uh, water supply pipe for innovation. So we wrote a note here that future innovations will most likely require monthly fee hikes or one-time charge per owner. It's usually going to be just a fee hike. So again, we look at the reserve funds that are now 4,200 yen per month. We can raise that to, say, 7,000 yen per month. Just under double again, gives us 7.8% net pre-tax, which is again very, very good for a central Hakata property. Let's try to increase that even further. Say so it goes up double, 9,000, still 7.5%. So that's a risk that most investors will be more than happy to take on, uh, considering the location and profile. Okay, so let's look at some buildings. Um, with buildings, bear in mind, um, there's no reserve fund pool. So you're in charge, you as the owner are a single owner, there's no owner's co-op, there's no building management company. You're in charge of everything that's being done to the property. So you need to set aside 10, or if you want to be super conservative, 15% of your rental income for any future renovation and maintenance, depending on the age of the building. This one was built in 1990, six units. Um, this one is also in Hakata, so the Fukuoka City's uh, main business district, but a bit of a distance from the city's main train station. 20 minute walk. Um, but again, if it's 20 minute walk to the city's biggest station, 
that's not as bad as um, other properties which are more suburban, in which case you're going to see them within 10 minute walk. Um, six units in the building, all fully occupied. There's one of them that's going to be vacated next month. But again, with this location, probably not too difficult to find new tenants. Renovation history, this is a wooden structure, not reinforced concrete like we, the others we've looked at. Renovation history, exterior was done six years ago. The roof was done 11 years ago. Um, probably got at least a good four or five years before we need to do any major renovations again. This one, three floors, uh, we can see up here, so there's no elevator. Um, so that gives us, I'd say, at least four or five years to save up on money before we have to do another renovation. So not a bad property overall. We've got some interior pictures as well. And the units seem to be um, 1R, 1K. It's a corner of some of the units, a corner units. Um, interesting looking property. Uh, I like it. Okay. On we go. Nagoya, again. Eight units, this one. Um, five minute walk to subway station uh, Honjin, which is very central. Two stations from Nagoya station, in fact. Uh, wooden structure again, eight units, and this one was just recently built, so it's 2012, uh, which is why we don't see a renovation history. There's not much that would have been done to it in such a short period of time. And nice new modern design, loft bedrooms, gas cooking, open plan, separate toilets and baths, laundry bay. So this, the interiors here are far superior to any of the old properties that we've been looking at so far. You can see um, see here with the stairs, there's a loft bed, a loft bedroom. And that's called a 1SK, I think, yeah, 1SK. So that's a living area plus loft and a separate kitchen. Eight of those, uh, nice, full of light, full of air, um, very good location. Notice how the purchase cost, as the property gets more expensive, the purchase cost percentage uh, drops. So with buildings, even if you're using a buyer agent like ourselves, you're looking at, uh, worst case, maybe 12, 13%, usually around 10 like this one. And this one's generating 6.9% for an entire building that's very, very good return. With, when you're buying entire buildings, you're going to get a mixed bag of tenants, obviously. Some of them will be paying more, some of them will be paying less, depending on when they moved in and what their profile is like. Um, so the average yield for buildings always tends to be lower than it is for individual units, where you can pick and choose the high rental ones. So 7% for a central Fukuoka property um, with 8 units in it. Um, especially at this age, is a very, very good return. And lastly, we've got a Yokohama building. Again, eight units, six floors. So if you look at the layout down here, we've got a shop at the ground floor, so commercial property on the ground floor, which is, again, gives us a nice diversity. Uh, second and third floors are one unit per floor. The fourth and fifth floor have got two units each, so smaller units on the fourth and fifth floor, and then a kind of penthouse on the sixth floor. This one is just the roof and the elevator uh, maintenance box. And this one, fairly, fairly central, uh, slightly suburban location, Nishi Ward, that's the western ward uh, of Yokohama City, but Yokohama being Japan's uh, second biggest city uh, and within 30, 40 minutes to central Tokyo. Um, suburban Yokohama is still very, very central. Renovation history, um, again, the roof was done four years ago. Just looking at the bigger ticket items. Uh, the exterior was done six years ago. I'm not sure if there's an elevator. There would probably be an elevator in this one. I think they're required for all buildings over five floors in Japan. So bear in mind there could be an elevator uh, renovation coming up soon. Um, but all in all, looks to be in good shape and generating just under 5% at the time of purchase, um, which again, Yokohama is pretty much um, these days same as Tokyo. So phenomenal return for buildings in Tokyo, Yokohama, Kawasaki, we'd rarely go beyond 3 maybe 4% if we're very lucky. Uh, individual units might get to 5%, but definitely not buildings. So we're quite happy with the yields on this one. Um, and again, we can try to negotiate for various reasons, the age of the building, the lack of renovation history, we might think an elevator renovation coming up soon. So these are all reasons uh, that we could use for potential negotiation. Okay, so that should give you a rough idea. These are all um, downloadable, of course. They'll come with the webinar recording and you should be able to download them. 
So let's just cover a few topics that you wanted to go over. And then let's get into the Q&A. So uh, COVID-19, Corona, you wanted to discuss, somebody asked, a few people actually asked uh, when they submitted the registration forms, they wanted to discuss um, the effect of the pandemic on the property market here in Japan, whether it's a good time to buy or not, and what does that mean? So just taking a bit of a macro view, um, COVID-19, like a major earthquake, like a major economic downturn, uh, like a dispute with a neighboring country, uh, these are all crisis times that obviously affect the property market, but they mainly affect the people um, who have been looking at it from a short-term view. So if you look at the COVID-19 as an example of what's happening now, we've got um, hospitality properties, so smaller scale hospitality properties like guest houses, share houses, people that have bought um, old Japanese traditional homes on the outskirts of big cities and renovated them and then started leasing them out by the month or by the day and so forth. Um, these guys, especially if they're mortgaged and suddenly had their bookings canceled a year or so in advance, and they're all in disaster mode now, and there are very attractive deals on the market right now. Um, very advisable. Some of our customers have definitely been looking at those. And not only will you get a good deal, you'll be helping a distressed seller out as well. And the other types of, um, I would call them silly types of investors um, who are waiting uh, for the last, 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 last moment just before the Olympics to try and sell their properties. Um, hoping that the price will keep going up now that the Olympics have been postponed uh, either to next year or indefinitely, um, or at least until further notice. Uh, these people are just disillusioned and disappointed that are uh, trying to sell as quickly as they can. Um, because again, thinking short term, obviously, one way or another, this will blow over. It might take a year or two years. Uh, things will go back to normal. In Japan, they haven't actually been affected that much. And... Um, we are now seeing it's definitely turned into a buyer's market. So all these distressed sellers and disillusioned sellers that were sitting on their assets are now uh, in a hurry to sell. We've seen prices uh, mainly in Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, but also in other cities um, as low as they were three, four years ago. Um, our clients are definitely on the buying spree now, and our clients which uh, have considered the sale for various reasons, we've advised to uh, sit on and not go for that at the moment. Uh, so now is definitely a buyer's market, and the same thing uh, goes for any sort of um, any sort of disaster or crisis that you see. Short term, it becomes a buyer's market, so that's the time to pounce. As recovery comes, uh, it might uh, bump up your asset prices. Most definitely will in most cases. Um, so really, you want to adopt. Um, you want to stay hedged, meaning you're not going to depend on that particular location or that particular income. Um, for mortgage payments or beyond what's reasonable. You definitely don't want to uh, depend on it for your living. So you should have um, hedges, and hedges and buffers and things that will enable you to weather a storm. And then this becomes an opportunity. If you're leveraged to the gills or if you're, you only got a short-term view and looking for a quick profit and then something happens, and you're just positioning yourself to lose. Um, so again, like we wrote here, short-term view, higher loss probability, long-term view, higher profit probability. That remains true anywhere and definitely these times as well. Um, another topic you wanted to discuss, REITs. Um, so what are REITs? To anyone who's not familiar with the term in general, REITs are real estate investment trusts, so they're publicly uh, traded companies that specialize in purchasing and managing and profiting from real estate in various sectors. And there are various advantages to diversifying your portfolio with uh, exposure to REITs. Uh, obviously, uh, these are stocks, so they're far more affordable. They could be a few hundred dollars or less. Uh, Japan REITs are specifically uh, most expensive per share price, so usually starting at five or six hundred bucks per share. And they're far more liquid. You can trade them. You can uh, try to capitalize on uh, short-term trends in the market by selling or buying them a lot more than you can with brick and mortar. Um, and they give you access to inaccessible sectors. What that means is... Um, typical small-scale investor usually would not be able to gain exposure to uh, very high-level assets. So um, central office buildings in Tokyo or Osaka or uh, giant uh, manufacturing uh, facilities, um, nursing homes, hotels, um, these sort of properties would not be available 
price-wise to, uh, to smaller investors, data centers, and so forth. Um, but if you're buying REITs that have exposure to these, then you're buying in, uh, you're getting exposure to these sectors at a very reasonable price, a few thousands or a few hundred dollars, and you can gain from whatever fluctuations happen um, in those particular areas. Um, Hands-free management, uh, which is a good thing for those people who don't want to be involved. It's not such a good thing if you want to have some say in how your funds are being managed. So once you've purchased these stocks, you don't have any say in what the company does with them. You collect your dividends and you watch the decisions that they make and the strategy play out or not play out. And you're hands-free, but you're also um, out of control. The only thing you can do is just try to sell, hopefully uh, not at a loss. Um, diversity and hedging, obviously, again, um, the lower the capital you put into any single investment, the more you can spread your capital over various sectors. Uh, in this particular case, you're getting exposure to both equity markets and the real estate sector. And diversity is always a good thing. Um, last thing to watch out for, they're not insurable. So a brick and mortar property that you own directly, you can insure. Um, stocks are obviously not insurable. And they're panic prone. So they're, because they're a lot more liquid, they're a lot easier to um, uh, fire sale whenever something happens as opposed to a, a real estate property, uh, which tends to create more volatility. So if you're the type of investor that panics, I wouldn't get into a, re I wouldn't get into a stock market at all. Um, direct ownership of a real estate asset will give you more time to cool down and think before you sell, uh, which is always a good thing. So Japanese REITs um, specifically. Um, like we mentioned, they're more expensive compared to global REITs, so the price per share tends to be higher uh, compared with other countries. Um, currently, sectors that are undervalued, which means it's a good time to buy into these sectors, are the hospitality and retail. Obviously, um, the corona outbreak um, has not treated these types of properties well. Logistics and data centers um, have been doing very well in the last few years, and they're doing even better now. Obviously, we're more at home. We uh, need more e-commerce uh, facilities. Uh, companies need more uh, shipping facilities closer to big cities. We've spoken about this in our podcast, if you're tuning into that uh, once in a while. And this all uh, just, just be, uh, increasingly become even more popular and more uh, hot sector with the pandemic. Um, J REITs are considered to be quite stable in the returns. Again, the last two or three months, maybe notwithstanding, but they're a pretty good investment. They provide stable dividends. And we can actually look at that. So you've got the link. It's a very good website um, that we like to look at when we evaluate REITs. Um, so this one gives you up-to-date information about um, all of the REITs that are uh, Japanese REITs that are trade, traded on the market. So on the right here, you can see the net, uh, net asset value ranking, the, or the P slash NAV, which is um, the price per net uh, asset values. And you can obviously see that uh, the hotel REITs and the onsen REITs are all being traded uh, for far lower values than they uh, actually hold. So this is an excellent time to buy into any of those REITs. On the left here, you've got them by uh, dividend ranking. So how much they've been paying out over the last few periods. Um, top performer, um, fifth place, and you can also click on any of these to see what they actually, uh, what they're actually composed of. So, what type of sectors, locations they actually deal in. You can see what's happened to their share price over time, and you can see how um, how how big the transaction volumes are for the share over time. And down here, you can see what they're actually doing. So, you can see Star, for example. Um, Nice, nice diversified uh, investment uh, strategy there. They do office, residential, hotels, logistics, and facilities, mainly focusing on host uh, um, offices and logistics facilities, which are both very good sectors to be in, but also a nice, uh, nice little spread of residentials and hotels there as well. And location-wise, we can see here that they're mostly focusing in Tokyo, on Tokyo and surrounds. So central Tokyo over here, and the entire Kanto region, uh, the rest of the Kanto region over here, and uh, suburban Tokyo here, with a little bit of um, other areas as well. So nice diversified REIT, and you can check that information for each and every one of the REITs on this website. Uh, we'll advise, if you're interested in that, we'll advise to um, start your uh, REIT journey from this website, the Japanese REIT journey at least, and uh, see what you can find there. Okay, so I think... 
that's it for what we want. Ah, syndications. You want to talk about syndications. So some of you um, submitted a request to discuss how would it be possible for them to uh, partner with other investors and set up a structure for the purchase of property in Japan. So there are a few ways to do that. Um, which, I mean, they get more creative and more cost-efficient as you move down the list. But if you're looking for the um, proper by-the-book way to form an investment partnership, it means that everyone is an equal rights shareholder. We're all major partners. We're all registered on the, um, on the incorporation article. And um, we all disclose the full capital that we're putting into the company from the get-go, and that's what we're going to use to buy and manage. Now... This is the cost, uh, the, the most expensive way to set up a company. It costs the most in taxes as well, so it's the least tax efficient. Um, but it does give you a good standing uh, for future uh, access to financing. So if you're looking at obtaining financing from a local bank once you've built up a bit of an income under your uh, company umbrella, um, this proper way will give you the easiest access to that financing. Now the middle way is similar to that, so we don't um, we don't declare our entire purchase and um, our purchase and operation capital in advance. We put the minimal capital on the registration article, and we have a mix of primary and minority partners, meaning that we've got um, one or two partners that are actually making management decisions, and the rest of them are just enjoying um, the, their equity and their dividends. Um, and then as we need to inject further uh, capital or as we need to uh, um, provide funds for uh, purchases and management down the track, we do that, but not as part of the initial declared capital. So that minimizes our taxes. It minimizes, um, not minimizes, but reduces our operational costs. And that's usually the best cost efficiency if you want to do this the proper way. There's one other way, which is the cheapest way to go about it. And in that case, uh, the company is not actually a partnership. It's set up uh, with just one or two partners, which are, again, the managing partners. And the investors actually lend money to the company, and then they secure their rights with a loan agreement. So they lend capital uh, to the company or operational capital to the company, not set up capital. And then their loan agreement specifies that they're entitled to such and such equity or such and such dividends. Um, that is the cheapest, both maintenance um, and tax-wise. And it's also smoothest operations because you don't need to, if one of the investors or a few of the investors want to sell their shares to other investors, investors come in and go out as they want to, there's no need to update the article of incorporation and pay any sort of taxes or fees related to that. So far lower on the legal fees as well. So cheapest maintenance, um, best tax position. Um, the disadvantage here is that um, you're not actually, the investors are not actually on the article of incorporation, which means that if they wanted to uh, prove their income as company owners in Japan for whatever purpose, um, usually it's going to be for uh, potential investment visas and business visas down the track, they can't do that. They're not actually on the article of incorporation. Um, otherwise, operationally, it's, it's pretty much the same structure in all, all cases. Okay. Q&A. So, let's run through the uh, questions that you've submitted to us in advance. Give me a brief moment there. So, we had a list of questions. I think some of them we've already uh, covered uh, in the presentation itself, so I might skip some of the content over there. Um, but what we actually wanted to review here, give me a second... Okay, so first question was, um, which areas are the most foreign friendly to buy in? I heard from some friends that it was difficult to buy from foreigners and they needed to get a Japanese intermediate to finish a negotiation. And so that's true. We covered a lot of that in the first webinar. Basically, areas that are foreign friendly to buy, meaning that they've got um, realtors there who can service foreign buyers in English or in other languages, 
um, are areas that are usually too hot for comfort as far as yield is concerned. Again, the last two, three months notwithstanding. So these days you can actually find pretty good deals in Tokyo and Osaka and Nagoya as well. Um, but generally speaking, le Tokyo, let's say, would have 12, maybe 15 uh, agencies and property management companies that you can work with in English and are foreign friendly. Um, Osaka maybe has three, four, or five of those. Fukuoka has one or two. Um, Nagoya similar. So the more attractive an area is yield-wise, uh, the less known it is to international buyers. Um, and then that's where the higher yields are. Areas that do have a lot of access to international buyers and where people have actually set up shop to service international buyers, usually the other places where prices have gone uh, far beyond comfort levels and yields are severely compressed. So uh, yes, a Japanese intermediary um, is highly recommended uh, if you want to just venture into these areas that are more attractive yield-wise. Um, that can be a friend or a family member or a business partner or a buyer's agent like ourselves. So it's entirely up to you. But if you want access to the entire market, including the more attractive areas, uh, yes, a Japanese intermediary is um, not a requirement but makes things much, much easier. And uh, next question, as far as I know, non-resident investors cannot open Japanese bank accounts for collecting rent, making payments. Are there any exceptions? So yes, that's true. It's not a government policy, it's a bank policy. So the bank here, banks here, um, in most cases are very old school. Even the select one or two of them that offer English services or English internet banking to some level uh, do not let non-residents open Japanese bank accounts. Um, there were a few international banks that had what they called a um, uh, foreign investor account option, but these were really not practical accounts. So I think from memory they cost about uh, 50 bucks per transaction. And if you're collecting rents, that's only, you know, if a property manager deposits a three or four or five hundred dollar uh, rent check uh, once a month and you pay 50 bucks for that, that's ridiculous. And they also required you to hold 50000 in the account at all given times and to keep it active. So th these were not very practical. Uh, what people do with their non-residents is, uh, again, either find a property manager who can deal with foreigners, which, like we mentioned in the first question, is going to be difficult out of um, a few major destinations, um, or alternatively just uh, work with a buyer agent uh, like ourselves, in which case... Uh, we collect and pay expenses into and out of our own corporate accounts and we provide you with an annual uh, or biannual statement depending on the size of your portfolio and then you just instruct us whenever you wish to uh, send funds across back to uh, whichever account you want them in. Okay, next question, actually a series of questions. Um, monthly rent, how much will the property devalue over 30 years if in a prominent area? My current thinking is buying a place in Tokyo where I live and then renting it out to domestic Japanese residents. Uh, i.e. is it better to overpay for apartments in brand new properties instead? Um, so by devaluation, I'm not sure if you mean depreciation or devaluation. If you mean depreciation for tax purposes, um, reinforced concrete structures depreciate. Uh, again, this is just for tax purposes. It doesn't mean that the building is actually non-usable anymore. Uh, but their tax has depreciated fully within, I think, 47 years. There's been talk of extending that, but I don't think that's happened yet. And for wooden structures, that's 25 years or so from memory. Um, whether that's going to be reflected in market prices or not, um, not necessarily. So if a property in a prominent location and the economy has done well, and so we've seen, let's say, central Tokyo, Osaka, Fukuoka properties between 2012 to 2016, um, 17, 18 in most cases, even properties that were quite old, so 1972 or three, um, almost doubled in price. So the, the structure will obviously depreciate over time and devalue over time, but if the land uh, is in an attractive location and the general economy in that area and the rest of Japan does well, um, not necessarily. Um, personally, for rental purposes, I wouldn't buy new developments um, just because they tend to depreciate really quickly uh, in the first few years and they tend to lose value really quickly in the first few years 
and considering their price when you purchase them, the rental yields are very low. Um, but they do carry less maintenance and less renovations, at least for the first 10 years or so. Um, so I guess it's a personal criteria and personal preference thing. I can't really advise as to A or B. If you're looking for the highest yield, no, I wouldn't buy new apartments and brand new properties. If you own an apartment within an apartment block, how does it work if the building owner decides to knock the building down? Um, well, if you own an apartment within an apartment block, there is no building owner. It's an owner co-op and they have to vote on any sort of major decisions like knocking down the building or selling it to a developer. And they need 80% uh, agreement from all owners before they can go ahead with any of these decisions. Um, it seems that this is a common case every 30 years in Japan. Um, not sure where that information comes from. Uh, we certainly see properties uh, being maintained. You might be talking about houses, um, which can be renovated to the point of rebuilding uh, every 30 years or so, but definitely not uh, reinforced concrete buildings and not even the wooden buildings. If it's a multifamily uh, property, it's not likely that it's going to be uh, definitely not going to be knocked down after 30 years. It might be uh, renovated significantly, but not knocked down. Um, i.e. what if you're in year three of a 30-year mortgage? Um, well, again, knocking down the building is not very likely um, for anything uh, 30 years old. If you've purchased a building um, that's beyond, say, 45 or 47 year old, uh, at the time of purchase, it's not likely that you're going to get a mortgage for it. And if you've purchased in cash, then um, again, a building doesn't get knocked down unless somebody's planning to do something with it. So it's either going to be rebuilt or sold to a developer, in which case there'll be some manner of compensation involved, whether it will be super attractive or not, and depends on the developer, depends on what the owner has accepted or not accepted as a group. Um, and that's a really a case-by-case -case basis. So it's, it's difficult to comment on that. Uh, do you work with many Tokyo residents? I am a current Tokyo resident with permanent residency. I speak Japanese, but I'm not confident enough in my Japanese to do all the paperwork, etc. And um, so, yes, we definitely work with a lot of, um, not necessarily Tokyo, but Japan residents. So as a buyer's agent and portfolio manager, we uh, work with about 70, 80% overseas investors, and the rest of them are all residing in Japan. And um, people just like yourselves that speak or read or write Japanese to a certain level, but either don't have the full language skills or the full confidence in uh, their property investment experience um, or just don't have the time or the inclination to deal with things directly on their own and want full access to the entire market, not just people who agree to work with foreigners. So we help them bridge that gap by um, providing the Japanese entities with a Japanese entity to deal with and providing them uh, with a single point of contact for all information so they don't have to be bothered with five or six or seven different entities for each and every property that they deal with. Um, so yes, the answer is yes, we do definitely work with Tokyo residents, quite a few of them. Okay, looking into Japan's longer term property investment market with the Olympics still in question, even as the next year event and general economic downturn for Japan's economy as a result of the current pandemic, which sector is best to get involved with and which sector is most sustainable? Mm -hmm. Um, so we've covered that a little bit when we talked about the REITs. Uh, residential is not going anywhere, okay? So long-term residential, people still need a place to live. And the cash cows have always been um, properties that are geared towards lower income and lower rentals um, as a rule, and they're not likely to drop far beyond that. I mean, you might... We haven't had too many vacancies um, as a result of the pandemic or following the pandemic. It is difficult to get them tenanted now because people are just not moving around as much. So if somebody does move out mid-pandemic, you're probably going to be waiting a good few months uh, to get a new tenant. But the residential, the long-term residential um, sector has always been the most stable sector. And that's usually the case in any economy, not just in Japan. Um, offices uh, have done well. We've spoken to uh, somebody on our podcast uh, who's an expert on uh, mega commercial deals, office towers and so forth uh, in the uh, in central Japan, uh, central Japanese cities, and um, from his reporting, offices are still doing very well. Companies are definitely not closing. Bear in mind also that um, unemployment and firing people and that sort of thing that you see in other countries when crisis hits, this doesn't happen much in Japan. Um, it may not be as a lifetime employment as it used to be uh, 10 or 20 years ago, but it's still very difficult to fire people in Japan. 
And you see now that, you know, the lockdown is not really a lockdown. Companies are still working, even if the, some of the staff are working from home. And um, so offices, again, are still doing quite well. Um, hospitality and retail uh, are not doing well at all, like we mentioned when we spoke about REITs. So now is an excellent time to buy into those or ex-hospitality, ex-retail properties. Um, so shops, hotels, onsens, guest houses, share houses, Airbnb type properties, these are all... Um, they're not doing very well at all. So I wouldn't. I, this is not a good time to enter operations of such properties, but it's an excellent time to buy them. Um, uh, data centers, logistics properties, as we've mentioned, have been going up in recent years and will continue to go up. They're actually doing even better now with people um, uh, shopping online a lot. Um, the one sector that's taken a bit of a back burn now is probably shared office and um, shared living arrangements or so share homes and share offices um, are probably on a bit of a freeze at the moment. I wouldn't go right into them at the moment because of the pandemic and also because of the uh, WeWork fiasco that happened a few months ago and people are re-examining the operational models in this particular sector. So I'd probably take a rain check on that at least for a year or so. And obviously nursing home and aged care facilities in Japan is a very good market and demand for that is going to go through the roof. It already is going through the roof. There's still a bit of a lack of um, proper um, models for investors to be involved in these types of projects unless you're planning to buy and run them uh, completely on your own. Um, but it's uh, very much a sector to look into. Uh, specifically in Japan. Okay, and last question before we sign off for the day. Uh, explain the cash-only deals, which are not eligible for bank financing for various reasons. What are they called? Can they be good rentals? What do you advise? Um, so I don't know that they've got a specific name, but basically most of the lenders that we're aware of, um, especially for foreigners and even more so for non-resident foreigners, um, will only lend for a minimum of uh, 10 or 20 million per property, per asset. So the cash-only deals are usually um, individual condo units or old houses um, that cost below that. So anywhere between, say, 20,000 US to 100,000 US. And those are actually the cash cows. So rental-wise, they yield the highest returns. The banks are not interested in lending for them and because too much paperwork and too much of a hassle for them to uh, deal with that uh, tiny loan amount and tiny uh, income that they get from them. Um, but they are, yes, very good rentals. Um, whether we would advise to purchase them or other properties, again, depends on investor uh, portfolio and investor criteria and what you've got, uh, what you're invested in other countries and other sectors. So if the majority of your investment portfolio is more speculative um, you know, low on the dividends, but high on potential growth. And then, yes, maybe it's a great idea to get into high rental yields uh, when you're diversifying. And in that case, we would recommend the cash cows. If, on the other hand, you're getting high dividends, um, but not much potential growth, then it might be a better idea to go for more expensive properties uh, leveraged with financing in areas or sectors that have potential growth, even if the current rental yields or dividends are lower. So, um, like we say in many cases, it's really a case-by-case case and investor-by-investor investor scenario. And we're, of course, happy to advise uh, and happy to uh, provide one-on-one -on -one consultations. We don't charge. We're always happy to talk shop. So feel free to hit us up in private messages um, or email or telephone call. Uh, we can book a day and schedule any conversation that you want to have with us. And we don't charge for our services and we're not offended if you end up doing it on your own, we're always, again, happy to talk shop and happy for you to keep us in mind if and when the time is right. All right. So thanks very much for your time today, folks, and hope you've enjoyed this. And uh, please keep the questions coming via private correspondence. Looking forward to speaking with you again. Okay. So that was it, our second webinar. Hope you've enjoyed it as much as I did. Now, if you'd like to receive notice on the next webinars we've got coming up, do drop us a message or a comment to let us know and we'll add you to our mailing list so that you'll receive a heads up on the next one. Uh, it's always a lot better to join live on the day if you can because you can also type in questions as we go along as well as read other people's questions as they come up, uh, which just further enriches the webinar experience and the value that you can gain from it. 
We'd also love to hear from you on which topics you'd like us to cover in the next sessions, whether it's in the next webinar or maybe a separate Q&A session that we've got in the works. So don't be shy. Let us know what you think and what you'd like us to discuss on future webinars, Q&A sessions, or just simply in our upcoming podcast episodes. We aim to please, and any feedback from you helps us um, tailor the content that we share directly to your needs. So that's it from us for today, folks. Do share the love and let people know about this podcast if you think they could gain any value from it. And of course, as always, we'd really appreciate your comments and as well as your ratings, reviews on the iTunes store or Spotify or anywhere else where good podcasts can be found and rated. It helps us reach more and more people, which is a win-win situation for everyone involved. Hope to have you again with us next time. And until then, from all of us here at NTI, stay safe and have a blast. Yoshiku!